This is the Rocket Belt 2000, the jetpack behind one of aeronautic engineering's strangest stories. At the heart of this tale are three men, Brad Barker, Larry Stanley, and Joe Wright, who clashed over their dream of building a gadget like the kind they had seen in the movies they watched as kids. But what started as a promising project to bring its developers fame and fortune only led to assault and kidnapping, with an oddly timed murder adding another layer to the chaos. One lawyer involved in the case even described it as, quote, something out of a cheap mystery novel. So what exactly happened with the Rocket Belt 2000? And how did it cause these guys so much strife? The earliest jetpacks were developed for the US military in the 1960s, although their practicality in combat missions was proven to be limited. These tests were soon abandoned, and development of jetpacks and rocket belts was relegated mostly to hobbyists from there. The most promising design was the Bell Rocket Belt, which although workable was limited by the hefty fuel requirements needed for sustained propulsion. This device could carry its pilot for just 20 seconds. The Bell Rocket Belt enjoyed use as a prop in films like Thunderball. Bill Souter was the go-to operator for the Bell Rocket Belt, learning the ins and outs of its construction and limitations, and even helping engineer Nelson Tyler develop an updated design. Piloting the Tyler Rocket Belt soon passed to a stuntman named Kenny Gibson, who flew it during several Michael Jackson concerts in the years to follow. Paul Brown wrote in his book, The Rocket Belt Caper, that Kinney later purchased the Tyler Rocket Belt from an amusement park it had been sold off to, and quickly went about finding ways to improve on its design. For this, he'd enlist the help of Brad Barker, a member of his ground crew from his residency at Disney World. According to the Rocket Belt Caper, Brad had previously helped Kinney recover some stolen items from a man named Larry Stanley. Larry was a former flight instructor who was once Brad's partner in a hot air balloon company, and had quarreled with both Brad and Kinney on separate occasions. Following a failed business venture, Larry stole parts from the Rocket Belt from Kinney while he was out of town, and Brad was tasked with getting them back. So, he recruited a karate master friend of his, confronted Larry and his goons at a property near Houston, and beat one of his associates with a baseball bat. Needless to say, Larry relented and returned the stolen goods. For now, Kinney was happy to have the parts back for his cherished rocket belt. But greed soon took the story in an unexpected direction. Brad continued helping Kinney with the upkeep of the Tyler rocket belt until 1991, becoming enamored with the device and how it earned Kinney up to $25,000 for each event it was booked for. As such, Brad began thinking of ways he could improve the design as part of a get-rich-quick scheme. Kinney, of course, wasn't pleased when he caught wind of this, but Brad's mind was made up. He was going to design his own rocket belt, even if it cost him one of his oldest friendships. Plowing ahead, he called on a friend named Joe Wright, who owned a car audio shop in Houston and could rent space there while Brad designed his dream invention. Joe was kind enough to allow Brad to defer rent payments until the belt was constructed and turning a profit. But they still needed someone with experience in aeronautic engineering to make it happen. For that, they turned to none other than Larry Stanley. Paul Brown wrote that despite their past conflicts, Brad and Larry now had common ground as men who had both bickered with Kenny Gibson. According to an article in the LA Times, Brad and Larry borrowed thousands of dollars from their mothers to develop a design they soon dubbed the Rocket Belt 2000. Brad went about procuring materials to build the device, while Larry sorted out the logistics of assembly. And so, in 1992, the American Rocket Belt Corporation was born. Even with the combined experience of the three men helming the operation, they'd still need the help of a professional to get the project off the ground. For this, the entrepreneurs turned to engineer Doug Malowicki, whose expertise was crucial in determining how the Tyler Rocket Belt's design could be improved. Doug became the brains behind the Rocket Belt 2000's motor, analyzing what materials could be swapped out for greater efficiency. He suggested using lighter metals like aluminum and titanium to make the belt more nimble, along with stronger composites that allowed it to carry more fuel. The team spent the next two years refining the design and preparing it for flight. And by the end of 1994, their hard work had paid off. Doug Malowicki described the improvements on his website as follows, quote, The RB2000 will fly 50% longer than the 1960s technology belts. Pretty impressive, until you realize it just means you get to fly for a whole 30 seconds instead of a mere 20 seconds. At last, the new and improved Rocket Belt 2000 was ready for its first trial run that October, with the team inviting Bill Souter to be its test pilot. All signs pointed to the project being on the right track, but an internal conflict was brewing that threatened to bring everything crashing down. 
By now, Brad had developed a paranoid possessiveness over the rocket belt, even polishing it while wearing gloves and refusing to let anyone else handle it. At first, this was mostly directed towards outsiders, but in time, Brad's temper caused him to lash out at his business partners. During one argument over who should be able to fly the belt, Brad pulled a gun on Larry and pointed it at his head for several minutes before the situation de-escalated. And this wouldn't be an isolated incident. Not long after that, Larry accused Brad of overcharging for the cost of materials and even pocketing leftover cash according to Deseret News. A violent confrontation between the men ended with Brad beating Larry with a mallet, leaving him with considerable head injuries including a cracked skull. Both men were charged with assault, but Larry managed to get his charges dropped. Brad, however, was convicted and put on probation for two years. The LA Times wrote that following the assault, Brad was accused of stalking Larry and his family for some time after. Joe sided with Brad despite his volatile nature and put a line on the rocket belt, arguing that Larry owed him back rent, effectively casting him out of the partnership. It would be the last time Larry ever saw the Rocket Belt 2000 in person. Meanwhile, Joe and Brad forged on with their work on the rocket belt to get it ready for more testing in the new year. With the finish line nearly in sight, Bill Souter took the belt on its maiden voyage in January 1995. Bill himself said of the device, quote, this is the finest version of the rocket belt ever crafted, a real work of art and one pretty bird. Most of these tests were conducted outside of Joe's shop using a tether for safety. After the belt's function was ascertained, they moved on to the airport to fly it untethered. The first few tests were a success, and despite one rough landing towards the end, the rocket belt was deemed operational. Brad went ahead and won his first contract showing off the belt before a live audience doing so at the 1995 NBA Championship victory party for the Houston Rockets. Considering the great lengths gone to to build the belt, few at the time knew this would also be the last time anyone saw it. After Bill Souter's dazzling flight received a roaring reception, the belt was allegedly returned to Brad who loaded it up in his trailer and drove off with it, never to be seen again. Larry Stanley seethed as he watched the event play out on television, having grown bitter over being cut out. He developed an obsession with getting the rocket belt back at any cost, a pursuit that would consume the rest of his life. Brad and Joe were sued by Larry, who accused them of stealing the belt for, quote, their own personal use, benefit, and monetary gain. Brad remained elusive, giving a deposition in 1996, but otherwise staying mum about the belt's whereabouts for the next two years. Frustrated by his obstinance, Larry had his lawyer post a $10,000 reward to anyone who could deliver him the rocket belt but this finder's fee would never be collected. The lawsuit was to go to trial in July 1998. Despite Brad giving Larry the runaround, there was still one man who could prove useful, Joe Wright. Larry believed Joe was growing fearful of Brad and his explosive temper and just wanted to wash his hands of the situation. It didn't help that his car audio business was flailing, leaving him strapped for cash. Mac Montandon's book Jetpack Dreams added that Joe had fallen prey to a crystal meth addiction, further accelerating his downward spiral. Here was an increasingly desperate man that couldn't afford to lose Larry's lawsuit, now pleading with him to settle things outside of court. A deal was soon struck. The men would meet at Larry's lawyer's office, but at the last second, Joe pulled out. Larry believed he was afraid of the implications of the two being seen in public together, arranging instead to chat over the phone about Larry's lawsuit. They eventually agreed that Larry would drop his complaint against Joe on the condition that he help locate the rocket belt. To ease Joe's worries about Brad, Larry offered to front him money to help him skip town. Unfortunately, an extreme twist of fate spelled disaster for this plan, taking the rocket belt saga in a far darker direction. Joe was found dead in his home the next day from an apparent bludgeoning, less than two weeks before the trial was set to begin. The beating was apparently so brutal that dental records were needed just to identify the body. Although authorities rushed Brad in for questioning, the results were inconclusive and he was let go. Brad's alibi relied on phone records that showed him as out of state at the time of murder. He argued that the sheriff's department tried linking the death to the rocket belt's disappearance, insisting the two events had nothing to do with one another. Nevertheless, he refused to divulge what happened to the rocket belt. Though Brad remained a suspect, as of spring 2024, Joe Wright's true killer has yet to be identified. Larry's lawsuit didn't hit the courts until summer 1999. He was seeking half a million dollars to pay for the lost income of renting the belt since 1994, 
though more than anything he just wanted the rocket belt back. As Brad and his defense were a no-show at the two-day trial, default judgment was awarded in Larry's favor. The judge ordered Brad to hand over the rocket belt along with $10 million in damages. Still, Larry remained fixated on the whereabouts of the rocket belt. Quote, The only things that carry you through life are persistence and determination. So if I'm persistent and determined, I will recover that rocket belt. It has been four years, and I'm not anywhere close to giving up on it. Brad was incensed by the judgment and vehemently denied he knew of the belt's location, telling the press, quote, Even if I had it, I would smash it into a million pieces with a road grader. In the meantime, he had found himself in hot water over unrelated burglary charges. He managed to get out on a $25,000 bail under the condition that he remain in Texas or Arkansas. That's when the Rocket Belt saga took yet another wild turn. Brad got a call in late 1999 from a Hollywood stuntman named Christopher Wenzel, who he had met years earlier. According to the LA Times, he was offered the chance to fly down to work for a few days, but quickly realized that things weren't as they had seemed. After their initial meeting, Christopher took Brad boating until the evening. Everything still seemed promising until Christopher brought Brad back to his home in North Hollywood. That's when he turned on Brad and began threatening him. We walk in the house, and I sat down at the desk. And when I looked up, Chris Wenzel was in front of me, had a pistol pointed at my forehead. And uh, as strange as it may sound, I smiled at the guy. Before long, Brad found himself handcuffed, strapped with duct tape, and forced to wear a pink velvet hood to prevent his escape. According to Brad's testimony of the incident, he was held between November 26th and December 3rd, during which he was questioned about the whereabouts of the rocket belt. Eventually, his kidnappers stuffed him into a crate, asking him if he had a fear of snakes and rats. Occasionally, he'd taunt Brad by saying he knew where his son lived and that he would hurt the boy if Brad didn't comply. At one point, Christopher allegedly drilled holes into the box. Brad testified that he overheard his kidnapper saying, quote, the more holes, the faster it will sink, implying that he would try drowning Brad if he kept refusing to cooperate. Fear overcame Brad, and he began begging for a swift end by asking the kidnappers just to shoot him and get it over with. After a few days, a familiar figure stepped out from the shadows, revealing himself as the mastermind of the plot. It was none other than Larry Stanley, driven by his obsession to reclaim the Rocket Belt 2000. Larry began threatening Brad with a gun, telling him, quote, things could get worse. Yet even under the threat of murder, Brad remained steadfast, refusing to divulge the precise location of the rocket belt. All Brad would say was that it was in the possession of a third party who he owed money to. But Larry wasn't having it. He arranged for a notary to come to the house and have Brad sign over the rights to the rocket belt. After almost a week of captivity, Brad finally relented. But the whereabouts of the rocket belt would remain a secret. Not long after, Brad was miraculously able to wiggle out of his bindings while his kidnappers were distracted and escaped through a window. He immediately contacted authorities, and before long, Larry Stanley and his accomplice were arrested on charges of extortion, kidnapping for ransom, and false imprisonment by violence. The pair were looking at life behind bars. The case went to trial in the new millennium. Larry's defense attorney argued that Brad had proven in the past to be untrustworthy, and that he had twisted the facts about what had happened. She instead claimed that Brad had a bounty on his head for fleeing Arkansas while out on bail for his burglary charges. Larry's lawyers insisted that he and Christopher were merely acting as bail bonds agents who tracked Brad down after he left for Los Angeles. The prosecutor disagreed with this explanation of events though, revealing that the charges against Brad had already been dropped. Additionally, an agent from the bail bonds company testified that although she had given the men the go-ahead to pursue Brad, this was under the guise of them being registered bail bonds agents, which of course, they were not. The prosecutor went on to show the jury email correspondence between Larry and Christopher that proved this was a calculated extortion plot. Joe Wright's sister Nancy was called to the stand, where she testified that Larry was convinced that Brad had been behind her brother's death. Apparently Larry had confided to her that he would kidnap, torture, and eventually kill Brad if authorities failed to charge him with Joe's murder. Things looked bleak for the defense. Even during the trial, Brad still refused to say where the rocket belt was. He offered the occasional interview to television outlets and newspapers, but always avoided specifics. Well, I'm not playing with where the belt is. It's just why do people keep asking me that question? <laughs> if they quit asking, we could quit 
avoiding the subject. There is a simple one word answer you can right. give when they ask that would stop the question. Okay. When people say, where's the belt? Just you say, say, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. But that's not the real answer, is it? Well, you're just going to hammer me on this, aren't you? It's kind of a big question. But I've answered that question as best as it'll get answered. So move on to the next one. Do you think we'll ever see the rocket belt again? You know, you just never know. You never know. Eventually, the jury came to its decision. Larry Stanley and Christopher Wenzel were guilty of all charges. Larry remained defiant, insisting he hadn't done anything wrong. During the penalty phase, he fired his attorney and decided to represent himself, but this quickly proved to be a huge mistake. Sentencing took place on June 7, 2002, and Larry Stanley faced life in prison plus 10 years for orchestrating the kidnapping plot. The decision was partially driven by Larry's failure to acknowledge any wrongdoing. He was of course appalled by the ruling, saying, quote, Mr. Barker was not harmed in any way. I don't understand how this is a life sentence. Digging a deeper hole for himself, he told the judge, quote, Your Honor, I never imagined that I ever did anything wrong. I was just trying to be persuasive. Larry went on to tearfully explain how the financial strain of the ordeal had cost him everything and that his family was surviving on food stamps. The prosecutor naturally disagreed, retorting, quote, I don't know how he justified in his mind how it is legal to put someone in a box. In an unusual twist of fate, the kidnapping charges were dismissed and prosecutors moved to have the judge reduce Larry's sentence to eight years in state prison, citing his age and lack of criminal record up to that point. The prosecutor made the decision after Larry finally owned up to his crimes and apologized, telling the judge, quote, I owe you and the people of California an apology for taking so long to recognize my problem. My persistence and determination to obtain justice had become the obsession you spoke of in court on Friday. Despite Brad's victory in getting Larry behind bars, the Rocket Belt saga wasn't quite over yet. Larry's attorneys were still pressing Brad to reveal the whereabouts of the Rocket Belt, but he remained as tight-lipped as ever. The Rocket Belt caper claims that Brad had apparently left the prized invention with his old karate master buddy, and that the two men plotted to store parts of it in different locations so they could technically argue that Brad didn't have it. Instead, he delivered a box of spare parts to the courthouse during a hearing on August 13th, 2004 insisting that this was all he had left of the rocket belt. Larry's lawyers remained persistent, and Brad was ordered by a judge to present the belt to him by noon on October 15th, lest he be held in contempt of court. Failing to do so would levy fines against Brad along with six months in prison. The stubborn Brad didn't produce. This of course irritated the judge, who called the action, quote, a blatant attempt to subvert this court's jurisdiction and enforcement of its lawful orders. Brad was thus hauled off to jail. As a final insult to the court, the Houston Chronicle reported that a disrespectful Brad yawned as the judge passed down his sentencing. In the meantime, his lawyers filed an appeal. According to the Rocket Belt caper, Brad was indeed released after serving his six months. He had finally tired of the ordeal and was ready to put it behind him. As for Larry Stanley, he left prison in 2010. It appears he too had moved on from the rocket belt, instead finding solace in religion. He even received a bachelor's degree in biblical studies at the age of 74, although he died just three years later after a lengthy illness according to an online obituary. Brad Barker has remained quiet in the years since his release, and as of March 2024 still won't reveal whatever happened to the rocket belt 2000. Also unresolved is the question of who killed Joe Wright. Mac Montandon wrote in Jetpack Dreams that Brad Barker's lawyer has asserted that his client has been cleared by the FBI of the murder, and that the primary suspect is now an unrelated third party previously connected to Joe, but specifics are still unclear. With so many questions left unanswered, the Rockabout story remains a warning about unchecked obsession, and the self-destruction it can steer unstable personalities into over even the most absurd conflicts.